This is going to be aimed at beginners and people who don't necessarily identify as sound designers, so we won't be getting deep into the weeds with technical stuff and inundating you with a bunch of things you don't really need just yet. I'm going to go over some practical and philosophical stuff to chew on to hopefully get you making some cool sounds. If you're an animator or game dev who makes your own sounds, this is definitely for you. And this video will serve as a primer for part two, where we'll actually go in and look at the start to finish process of sound designing for an animation. All right, let's dive in. Number one, perspective. In the visual world, if you're cranking away on a piece for hours, you lose perspective. So what do you do? Well, you should probably take a break, but you're not going to because you have ADHD and you're laser focused on this thing you're working on and you haven't had water in six hours and you need to go to the bathroom and your neck hurts and the fucking dog needs to eat. <clears throat> Sorry. So you might flip the canvas or do the squint test and suddenly things start to leap out at you that your brain had just gotten used to. It's the same in the audio world. You'll get used to anything if you listen for long enough. So what's the canvas flip for audio? There are a few ways to gain perspective. One is to turn Turn the volume way down to where you can barely hear it. Now the balance between different elements is suddenly glaring. Oh, and if you don't know what the frequency spectrum is, it's just a way to represent the range of human hearing. So at the very bottom you have 20 hertz, that's the lows. So think like somebody's driving by and they have their subwoofer and they have the deep sub bass going. And then at the very top you have 20,000 hertz, think more like birds chirping. Anyway, so when you turn the volume down really low, the high and low end of the spectrum are perceived as quieter and you're left with mostly mid-range, which brings us to two, focus on the mid-range. The mid-range is the truth. If you've ever done any music production, you know this feeling. You just finished a mix and it knocks. Then you send it out to your phone or take it to the car and it sounds like this. <laughs> If we put an equalizer over this and focus it just on the mid-range, we can check in on that from time to time. Toggle it on and off. Every playback system can reproduce mid-frequencies, but not all of them can give you the highs, and very, very few can give you proper lows. So if you get everything speaking properly in the mid-range, it'll translate to any speaker. Number three, use a spectrum analyzer. There's a free one here, which I put in the description below. This is super helpful to monitor and make sure no part of the spectrum gets out of control. Use your ears first, but the analyzer can be a good backup plan. We don't have to kill every single resonance we see, but if something is egregiously poking out, it could be a sign to rein it in a bit. And it's just another way of maintaining perspective when your ears get tired. Number four, close your eyes. Listen back now. Can you still roughly tell what's going on even with no visual information? Is it clear enough what's happening? This can be a good way to test the strength of your sounds. Number two, Break the rules. intuition is king. If you have some familiarity with music production, you've probably heard really conservative rules like no more than three dB of compression or to make sure you're gain staging everything perfectly. And it's good to know the rules, but it's also really beneficial to break them. Clipping things on purpose, driving effects too hard or pushing them in ways they weren't intended. At the end of the day, the most important thing is how a sound makes you feel. If it does its job, then nothing else matters. 99% of listeners won't care what was side chained or compressed or clipped only if they liked it or not. So I would encourage you to push things and break the rules and ignore the meters when you can and only focus on the feeling. Turn the knob. Do you like what it did? Keep it. What does too much sound like to you? Where is that threshold where it doesn't sound good anymore? How far can you push it? Number three. Season as you go. In cooking, you add salt at a bunch of different stages to get all the flavors mingling and dancing together, drawing out liquids and flavors. The same goes for audio. Rather than dumping all the seasoning in at the end, on the master bus, you do it at the lowest level on the track level. For me, that often means compressing and saturating as I go. The sounds have the capacity for loudness and density and detail way downstream, long before they ever hit the master bus. Number four, purpose. When you go to pick up a tool, always have a goal in mind for it. Does this impact need to be bigger and punchier or does this tail need more body and sustain? Do I want this thing to sound ethereal or far away from the listener? What can I grab to get me closer to those goals? Number five, digital world. I don't know that much about photography, but I do know that I'm Old. And we used to use film and it was very flattering for some reason, kind of grainy and forgiving. And there's a parallel in audio. We used to have analog gear that would impart all kinds of harmonic distortion and nonlinearities to the signal that just made it sound a lot more lively. When you hear a pure digital recording, it's sort of sterile and lifeless. So just like an Instagram filter, we have to re-inject some of that stuff back into our recordings. That's where saturation comes in. This is what would happen when you push a signal hard and it would overload the physical components of the hardware. It creates harmonics and will make the signal much thicker and more rich and complex complex because of that added information. And in a sense, saturation makes things almost more real than without. 
If you go out and record something really loud on your phone, or really most devices where you haven't carefully gain staged, it's gonna distort. It's so loud and powerful, the equipment gets overloaded. It feels kind of like adding a screen shake to your game. Like, yeah, there's not really a camera there, but it does so much to add to the weight and feeling that something is stressed or equipment. So how much is too much saturation? What kind should I use? Well, that's a matter of taste. I tend to like things pretty crunchy, but even a very subtle, almost imperceptible amount can go a long way. It doesn't sound like much, but this signal has become so much more dense and rich and won't ever get lost in the mix because it'll be perceived as much louder than before. Number six. Exaggerate. Just like in animation, sometimes you have to stretch things for the sake of readability. You might pose things where it's easy to make out the silhouettes or squash and stretch your characters, smear frames or overhype with anticipation and follow through. It's the same with audio. Exaggerate transients, go overboard with your movement, use risers for anticipation before big moments, go big or go home. It's all a spectrum and stylistic choice. Push further than you think. Speakers are weird, unnatural things, and what sounds good in real life is often very different from what reads well through the speaker. Number seven. Interest. What makes a sound interesting? Well, it's super subjective, and you could probably write a novella on that, but to my ear, the biggest thing is movement. That just means some kind of change over time, whether it's filtering, distortion, modulation. Sounds in real life are changing constantly, and you'll almost never hear precisely the same thing twice. Keep it moving and changing. Number eight. I don't like it. Figure out what you don't don't like to get closer to what you do. Did this thing not hit as hard as you wanted it to and how can we get it to hit harder? Does this thing annoy you? Why? Is it too distorted or are there frequencies poking out too much? Number nine. The canvas is finite. You can only fit so much sound into one particular moment. Sometimes the key is to peel back layers to subtract rather than add. If something isn't giving the impact you want, it might be that you have to give it space to breathe and punch through. All right, that's it for this. Keep your peepers peeled for part two where, where we're gonna look at the front to back process of designing sounds against the scene and uh, make some sense of all of what we talked about here. Goodbye!